Hello there, and thanks so much for agreeing, coming and joining us for our sixth Wednesday webinar of 2021. Who would have thought, you know, almost at the end of March, um, where has the time gone? But thank you so much. You're joining us by Zoom tonight. We've just got a slightly marked time. If you've joined us before, you know this dance already. Uh, the fact that we have to just wait for our Facebook Live audience to join us but as before if you've joined us by zoom you'll know but if this is your first time then we do have a couple of poll questions during the course of uh, today's webinar so please do get involved in in those it they're not a test it's just to get a feel for for who's watching this evening and uh, to, to assist our two presenters and a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us by facebook live for this our sixth wednesday webinar of 20 21. It's great to have you with us and I'm delighted tonight to, or today to welcome Tamsin Furtado who is a social scientist who is currently a researcher at the University of Liverpool having spent some time at the Dogs Trust previously, um, a self-declared horse nut and to join her in the horse nut league is uh, Sue Hodgkins, our very own farm centre manager from Norfolk at a whole farm near Thetford. So it's great to have Tamsin and Sue with us this evening and it's great to have you with us too. And what the format of tonight is similar to many of the other webinars we've done. We've got two presentations, a longer one by Tamsin first, then a shorter one by Sue, and then it's over to you for the questions. So if you're watching on Zoom, then please do uh, use the Q&A function. By all means, use the chat function to chat amongst yourselves and with panelists, but for the Q&A function for questions, if you could. And if you're on Facebook, then if you just put your questions into the comments section, that would be great. If you're on Facebook also, please do share the, the, the live stream now if you're if you're watching it live. Um, and also, I hope you really enjoy tonight. And if you've been able to join us previously, you'll know that all of the webinars since the, the middle of 2020, all of the webinars are up on our YouTube channel. So please do go and look at them there. Um, we've covered a, a whole wide variety of topics. And in reg that regard, we are carrying on the webinars going forward too. So if you have any questions, uh, um, suggestions for what we might cover during our Wednesday webinars, then please do send them through to education at worldshorsewelfare.org. Now, I'm going to shortly be introducing Tamsin. Before we do that, I have to get through the critical stage of sharing my screen, which some of you will know can be a painful affair. But tonight, 20th time I think of asking, I think I'm just about getting the, the, the hang of it. So tonight's uh, focus is on alternative grazing systems. More about that in a second. Before uh, we get into to this evening's topic, um, we've got a poll question. If you're joining us by Zoom, you'll be able to respond to this directly. If not, if you're by Facebook, you can't join directly. You can obviously put your comments in the um, your response in the comment section. Now you can respond to more than one answer here, but do you currently use one of the alternative grazing systems listed? And we've got track system, equicentral system, rewilding, woodlands or moorlands, or I don't use one of these grazing systems, or I don't currently have a horse. As I say, um, uh, other than the last one, uh, or the last two, you could or you could answer certainly more than one. So please, again, no right or answer, uh, wrong answers, just want to get a feel for who's joining us tonight. Um, and in that, that regard, I just thought, whilst you're answering that, um, we'll just give you a very brief introduction to World Horse Welfare, if I can get the slides to move on. Um, many of you will know World Horse Welfare, founded in 1927, and at the heart of what World Horse Welfare is all about is to support the horse-human partnership in all its different Guises, guises. And World Horse Welfare, with so many other charities and NGOs, we recognise the power is in partnership. And that's why it's so great to have Tamsin with us tonight, because the report she's going to be sharing with us was a true partnership between the University of Liverpool, very much driven by Tamsin, but also a number of other welfare charities as well. So it was great to see something like that come, come to fruition. And in terms of what tonight's all about, it is about the use of alternative grazing systems. Now, there may be many different reasons why 
you have considered or are using uh, an alternative grazing system, you might have a small issue of mud. You might have a small issue of keeping your, the, the, the weight management of your horse uh, to the correct weight. You might have another health condition, or you might just want to give your horse a more sort of enriching, mentally stimulating environment in which to graze. For whatever reason, uh, Tamsin is going to give us a real good overview of what the pluses and minuses are of the different systems and how they can blend together so well. And also to show there's not only potential benefits for our equines, but also for us as owners too. So that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? But before I move on to introducing Tamsin, um, Basil, can you give us the um, answer to the uh, poll? please. We can get a feel. So six out of 10 of you don't use any of these grazing systems. Um, but of the third who do, well, no, that more than a third, um, who do is the track system. So that's by most far by most common. And then a small number on the equicentral rewilding and woodlands and moorlands. And so that's great. So that gives us a good blend for who's um, joining us tonight. So without further ado, I'm now going to introduce you to Tanzin, who I've mentioned already is a social scientist and is initially in uh, the field of human health and global health, but it's moved increasingly into uh, animal health and welfare field and around the whole behavioural change science, uh, which is so important to improving animal welfare globally. Now, Tamsin is very well known to many of us. I'm not sure how much, how many of you know that she has a fascination with goats. Um, and I think if she could have her way, if, if she could have one wish from her fairy godmother, it would be able to have um, a, a small group of goats that could do agility. That would put a big smile on Tams. I also understand she's quite keen on seeing she can teach a few pigs a few tricks as well. Uh, but Tams, in, in all seriousness, it's great to have you with us this evening. I'm really looking forward to hearing you sharing about the journey on this report to date. So without further ado, um, Tams, I'm going to hand over to you. Hello, I'm Tamsin. Uh, thank you so much to Rowley and everybody at World Horse Welfare for having me here today to talk about our project, the use of alternative grazing systems in the UK. Um, this is a project um, that was a collaboration between uh, various equine charities and groups, including the Horse Trust, World Horse Welfare, Red Wings, British Horse Society, Donkey Sanctuary um, and Beaver, um, and led by us here at, at the University of Liverpool, um, to really look at what's going on and the different ways people are managing horses. Um, across the UK. So really hope that you enjoy it and it gives you some food for thought. So the role of, of our horses in the UK has changed dramatically in the last 100, 150 years or so. Um, and they've moved really from being kind of working animals or at least sporting animals um, to being more towards the kind of pet end of the spectrum. So we now, um, most of us keep horses because, you know, we enjoy being around them. We like them, uh, you know, maybe to ride partly, but, um, you know, that's not usually the kind of defining reason that people have horses um, nowadays. It's more about, you know, enjoying caring for them, enjoying the relationship with them and so on. And that's wonderful. Um, but it's a different uh, system. So the way we manage our horses would need to kind of change as a result of that. So um, the idea of using kind of stables and uh, small paddocks made perfect sense for horses that were working all day, um, whether they were in the military or kind of working horses pulling a cart like at the top there. So they could then, um, you know, they would come back tired and um, having a small comfortable box to rest and eat and recuperate makes perfect sense um, and then turn out in, in, in rich grassy paddocks and so on. But given that our horses nowadays generally do relatively little physical exercise, so most leisure horses are, um, uh, you know, usually in a very light level of work, it doesn't really make sense to keep them um, in the same way necessarily. Um, and we also have a better understanding of the horse's actual needs as an animal um, and also of the environment and how we can better manage um, our pastures to, to, uh, to look after the land better. And even though our horses role has changed towards being a kind of pampered pet and that means that they have a huge amount of love and money and time spent on them that doesn't unfortunately mean that we uh now have no kind of equine well-being issues um here in the uk with their kind of role as a pet 
So um, we do unfortunately have an equine obesity epidemic in the UK. So we think uh, it's a, probably around 50% of our leisure horses are actually obese, um, which is a massive welfare issue because of, um, of course, links to laminitis. So our latest research shows that probably one in 10 horses, uh, leisure horses, get laminitis. And of course, most often that's related to equine metabolic syndrome. Uh, one of the major reasons uh, for that happening uh, can often be the horse being overweight. So that can be a really serious welfare issue, potentially leading to um, needing the horse needing to be euthanized or to a lengthy period of box rest and rehabilitation and so on, which isn't much fun for anyone. But we also have um, we also have issues around uh, stress and behavioural issues and so on, which aren't necessarily always as well recognised as they could be. Um, so even though our horses are thoroughly loved, we don't necessarily have ideal kind of welfare in the way that we uh, we might hope. Um, and. Of course, that's not necessarily just down to stabling or anything. Don't um, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that stabling is always inherently bad. But um, given that we know we have these issues um, and that it makes sense, doesn't it? If you're you know, if we're putting horses that aren't working very hard in a little box with uh, plenty of food where they're super comfortable and they can just chill out and lie down and then we put them in a small square paddock with lots of grass, it makes total sense that they will become overweight. Um, and that's one of our biggest welfare issues. So it was quite interesting um, for us as researchers to note, of course, that there are lots of people doing other things, um, like managing horses in other ways. And this was particularly interesting to a lot of the equine uh, rescue organisations, so World Horse Welfare, Blue Cross and so on, um, who also have um, the same welfare challenges with managing their own horses. So um, if you can imagine, you know, I'm sure lots of people listening to this call have had to manage their own horses weight and know how hard that is. So imagine if you're running a rescue centre and you've got 40, 40 little black and white cobs who are good doers and um, can't be worked very hard because they're being rehabilitated and so on. What's the best way of managing them in order to manage their weight, but also to um, keep them calm and happy and um, allow them to live together and so forth. So uh, we were interested in finding out more about what people were doing and why they were doing it uh, in order to manage their horses um, health and well-being. And that's really um, how this project came about. So what we did was to use a survey which was open uh, in the summer last year um, and we uh, basically did um, simple statistical analysis of the answers and what we call thematic analysis of uh, we had lots of space where people could uh, write and, and give us lots of detail about what, what they thought was important about the systems they were using and why. Um, and importantly, we also consulted with professional nutritionists, behaviourists um, and other equine professionals to give uh, their view of some of the issues that were brought up. And just a really quick note, um, I've described these as alternative systems um, and sometimes uh, people don't like that, which I totally get. When I talk about alternative systems, what I mean is systems which are not the normal, stable and uh, open paddock grazing that we use because that's the most normal thing. So um, the, the types of systems that I'm talking about are alternative to that. I'm not saying they're new. Yes, they have been around for a long time, but um, alternative is really the best uh, word that we can come up with for, for describing those types of systems. And also um, the other thing to note is that I'm not saying that um, these are the best ways of managing horses or that you can't achieve good welfare using the more uh, traditional normal setups um, at all. That We're just describing uh, these alternative ways um, ways of doing it so that hopefully we can all kind of learn and take uh, things that we think will work in our own settings um, to improve our own horses health and, and well-being. So overall, um, we were super pleased because we expected to have about, you know, maybe 100 people respond. We had 758 responses to the questionnaire. Um, most commonly, people were in the 55 to 56 age, uh, sorry, that should say 65 age group. And uh, most commonly, 76% of people had 20 years or more experience. So the owners using these alternative systems tended to be people who um, had been around horses for a long time. Um, you can see there in the pie chart, so 56%, which is the yellow, um, was the most common. That was the people who were using track systems. Then um, the next most common uh, was Equicentral, which is the uh, the blue 19 percent, the sort of um, I don't know, dark, darkish, uh, dark, dark sky blue, we'll call it. Um, then um, 
we also had um, a group of people who were using uh, a mix of track and equicentral, which I'll talk about. And then the other things people were doing were using turnout on moorland, woodland and rewilding. Um, and I'm going to talk about those each in turn. Um, I'll spend slightly longer on tracks just because um, there's a little more in the mechanics and they were the most popular. But um, I hope that it's interesting for you to hear the range of different things that people are doing. Now, all of these systems were based on the principles of trying to allow horses to have friends, forage and freedom, that what we call the three F's of horse needs. Um, now, we call these ethological needs. So that's the, the things that are really important for horses as a species. Um, so horses are obviously herd animals um, who ideally therefore need to be around herd members. Um, in the wild, horses would have um, would be obviously their grazing animals, so they would be moving around over long distances. So our studies of wild horses show probably more than 20 miles a day, uh, moving around, looking, you know, over sparse um, ground, looking for uh, different things to eat. And obviously, as a result, that means they have freedom of, of space, but also freedom of choice. So they can hang out, do what they want, you know, stop eating when they feel like it, start eating when they feel like it, groom, run, play with their mates, all that kind of thing. And these systems were, um, based around trying to create um, environments which allowed horses to have those three Fs um, uh, at all times. Um, which I think is really interesting because, again, if you think about normal stables and grazing, of course, you can absolutely also similarly allow your horse to have friends, forage and freedom um, with stables and grazing. But it's not quite the same in that it's not centred around providing those things. So, you know, if your horse is stabled, it's pretty, it's actually more difficult to provide it with a friend at the same time you have to like adjust things um if you see what i mean in order to provide that similarly if your horse is stable you have to work quite hard to make sure it has constant forage so these systems are centered around those three things first and foremost rather than it being you know those are things that we put onto a system we already have <laughs> So don't worry too much about the intricacies of this graph, but just to show you um, the health and well-being, the kind of reasons people said that they were using these alternative systems in terms of health issues. So there on the left, the most common reason that people were using these systems was because of laminitis. Um, the second most common was arthritis and the third most common equine metabolic syndrome. Um, and the next ones along there are breathing issues, behavioural and stress, ulcers, PPID and uh, other lamenesses. So um, that's really interesting because it tells us, I mean, we do know uh, laminitis, EMS and arthritis are probably the most common um, issues anyway that horse owners face. But um, all of these systems provide horses the ability to uh, move around as much as possible um, in a Un, as, as unstressful an environment as possible, um, hopefully, and um, and to have sparse kind of low calorie forages, which are ideal therefore in managing laminitis, uh, arthritis, and EMS. So I think that's um, that's really important. Um, it's important to say that there were no, you know, it, we can't say from the results that you know there is one system that's best for managing laminitis or one system that's best for arthritis because every system. So even within like a track system, you could have. Um, even within the same track system it could work really well for one horse and not so well for another horse or like there's a million different ways of setting up a track system so you can't definitively say you know this is the best system for xyz um but um yeah i think it's quite useful to know that those are the reasons people are, are kind of turning towards the use of these systems in terms of managing weight, which of course we know is one of the most um, pressing and difficult um, things for horse owners with the our traditional horse care, um, we had quite varied results um, with this. Now, I have to say this is owner reported weight loss on the use of these tracks. Um, there is an issue with that because there are lots of studies that show that um, we're not always, as owners, very good at uh, being objective about horses' weight or, or dog weight or children weight or anything. Um, that's not a criticism of horse owners or dog owners or, or parents or whatever. It's literally just because you love them and you see them all the time, your child, your dog, your horse or whatever. Um, it's really hard to be objective. So you, because you see them all the time, you don't notice that change. And also because you love them, you, it's, hard to, um, it's hard to kind of separate your feelings out. So that's not a criticism, but it is a, a <laughs> scientific fact that we're not always as objective as we would like to be and we were using owner reported data just in this survey so um do take this kind of you know lightly um but in terms of owner reported weight change um 
the study showed that tracks and the woodland system were the most likely to help people to lose weight to help people sorry to help horses to lose weight um help people to help their horses i suppose you could say um and uh, and also track equicentral hybrids were also successful however as i have said um that does really depend on uh the setup of the track or the woodland or whatever um <clears throat> so i'll talk more about uh about that a bit later and we'll also talk about the different mechanisms around um weight management uh on all of the different systems because they are quite different we had two unexpected findings one that um horse owners were quite commonly using um uh other grazing animals such as goats sheep alpacas uh chickens pigs um all sorts to help to uh refertilize the ground to manage the grazing and so on um and i i think that was really interesting i'll come back to that later and also my favorite finding um that horse owners were really keen to find ways of managing their horses which also work to better uh, improve the environment um, and whether that's kind of soil health plant biodiversity and so on and this is a really brilliant finding um and um i'll again come back to this but um yeah uh, we talk about this a bit more in the report and we hope to have lots of resources going forward about how to help how you as horse owners can um, do things which will maximise the um, plant life, wildlife, soil health and so on within your horse care. We also found that people were very keen on adding enrichment, which basically means anything that's going to give your horse, uh, you know, a positive kind of well-rounded um, experience of their lives. So different flavours ranging from, you know, like different flavoured water stations to soaked haze and different, you know, like soaked in different herbal teas, toys like the horse um, in there uh, with the ball, um, but also things like uh, sand pits, um, logs to walk over, steps to go up and down, different surfaces, scratch pads um, and so forth, which is fantastic. Um, and another thing that was really important was mud management, because obviously, sadly, for all us all, we have a lot of rain, uh, hence why we have so much grass and then we have so many fat ponies. Um, but as a result, mud management was really important. So uh, this word cloud just shows the uh, kind of most common things people were using in order to help manage their mud. Um, mud mats being very common this year um, in particular. Uh, so mud, con mud control mats is one make. There are plenty of others, um, but also gravel, stone, sand, concrete, hardcore, um, recycled road planings, uh, you name it, um, people are using it. So firstly, track systems. So put simply, a track system is instead of having uh, a square or open paddock you make a track around the outside of the paddock and you put the different resources so that's things like water shelter hay and so forth at different spaces around the track and the horse therefore has to walk in order to get to them so when it wants a drink it has to walk around in order to get to its water and so forth um now that's the kind of the most simple but lots of um bigger track systems and like the track yards that are um are coming up use really kind of integrated cool systems that go around lots of different fields so um you know there's one in wales with two miles of tracks going all around different woodland areas and different fields and so on um the idea is based on a book called paddock paradise by jamie jackson which is a really uh, interesting read um and uh is based on the idea that um uh jamie jackson noticed about mustangs and how far they were traveling um and that their hooves were in in often very nice health because of uh, going over lots of different surfaces and so on so a traditional paddock paradise um generally has no grass and um has has lots of different you know surfaces like gravel and rocks and so forth but obviously here in the uk we have a lot of grass um so um yeah so uh it's a bit different here but um there are we had actually uh eight percent of people using track systems had completely removed the grass on their system um and had um therefore completely grass free surface systems some people said they did things like making complicated shapes like spirals and zigzags and so on but this was um, quite a concern for our behaviorists who we were consulting because horses if you think that the kind of natural thing for horses is that they uh, they come from open plain environments where they have a lot of space and you know it's wide open space so their their brains are not designed uh, to be able to navigate like in and out of things or to work out how to get around to things so we've all seen that if you have like a gate here and this is a fence and here's the food bucket and there's your horse 
they they find it hard to work out to go around so um it can be quite stressful for them if you put them in anything like a spiral or a zigzag or whatever um, and even uh, just a normal track some horses would find it pretty uh, tough going especially if you know if they've traditionally been in a stable and a small paddock they haven't kind of developed that spatial awareness so they will sometimes find it quite hard to get used to the idea that they have to walk around a track so you do have to be quite careful with that and um, make sure you introduce it slowly and avoid any complicated shapes. Um, width of tracks is quite important to people because um, obviously if you have it wide then that means that the horses are less likely to kind of uh, you know be squashed in together and argue and fight and so on but on the other hand most people have tracks because of weight management and uh, if you have it wide you've got more grass to deal with so the average rule of thumb with track users is never to have it narrower than one and a half times the length of the longest horse so uh, in my herd our biggest horse is uh, six foot six so our track would be approximately nine at the absolute narrowest approximately uh, ten, uh, nine, between nine and ten feet uh, if you if you see what I mean um, and so that hopefully gives them enough space to move around but even within one system you would have areas that are narrower and areas that are wider to give them uh, space to kind of chill out together and stuff uh, most commonly people had very low grass tracks and then fed um, supplementary forage like hay uh, all year round, uh, often soaked hay. So most commonly people had two to three horses on three to five, sorry, three to five horses on two to three acres of land. And people said about tracks that it really helped to them to manage their land better because most of the time the horses could be on the outside of the track um, but uh, that meant that they, the inside was kept as they could leave it as standing hay, uh, they could cut it as hay, they could put this, you know, thinner horses on the middle while the fatties stayed on the outside and so forth. Um, it was an issue that people had to be in control of their own land, so 66% of people were in control of their own land, although people do manage to do them at livery, but usually, you know, a, a lot less, so, you know, often livery yard, uh, ones, if you're within a, a normal traditional livery yard, that will be like an electric fence around the outside, rather than, you know, obviously you being allowed to, you'd be very lucky if you're allowed to put in, you know, different surfaces and so forth. Um, and as I said, 8% of people had entirely grass-free tracks. And what people really liked about the track systems was that the horses had extra movement. Um, lots of people, this hasn't been scientifically kind of validated, but lots of people put um, those pet trackers on their horses' head collars um, or rugs and see how far they move and found that they've moved, uh, they move a lot more than they traditionally would in a normal paddock. Um, they can move as a herd um, and you can, you know, some, um, some places will have two tracks next to one another if need be and so on but you can have um you can have them uh, out with their friends the whole time and you don't need to kind of stable them often you can have like an open barn or whatever um so they can they have free choice of where they go when they hang out when they sleep when they move around the track when they play and so on um tracks really encouraged enrichment which i think is really nice um and you know part of that is you want to encourage them to keep moving as much as possible so it makes sense to encourage to put out different things around the track so maybe you know you'll put a new herb garden in and then you'll put i don't know some different exciting stuff on a different area of the track and um you know that kind of thing to encourage um you know to give them a good life but also to uh, keep encouraging that movement and um searching uh, for fun stuff um, and it was also quite a flexible way of keeping horses. So, as I mentioned, if you've got thinner horses that need a bit more grass, you can put them in the middle. Um, you can also just um, open out your electric fence a bit so they have a bit more grass. You can keep your fatties in a certain bit and so forth. Um, in order to make it work, um, people did need good fencing, particularly if you've got good old Shetlands. They're so good at escaping, aren't they? Um, so, yes, if you obviously uh, track them, the simplest way of doing it is using an electric fence inside the perimeter of your paddock. Um, but, you know, it depends on how much your horses respect electric fences. Um, we have three of our four who have no respect whatsoever for electric fences. So um, I I understand how tricky that can be. Um, people do say that using uh, wooden posts can make a big difference rather than uh, rather than the plastic ones and also using rope rather than tape as long as you have break points on it. Um, a plan for winter was very important as well because uh, you, you know the point of a track is that you have maximum footfall on a small area. Obviously that 
what's that going to create as soon as it's wet mud so um most uh, people who had grass tracks took them down completely in winter and then put them back again in um in summer um or surface them so yeah that does need thinking about um people also needed a plan for grass management so if you have a grass track uh, it can be quite hard to keep that grass low enough for it actually to um be enough to reduce your horse's weight so um people often needed to do things like muzzle their horse as well or uh, strip graze the track or use sheep to eat down the track um and so forth uh so yeah don't you can't unfortunately assume that because you have a track that will mean that there's not there's little enough grass that the horse will lose weight um because of the you know unusual nature of a track sympathetic landowner or sharer um was also necessary some people shared fields and, and found it difficult to build them for that reason um and it was also really important to monitor health and weight of the horses because some horses um as i said don't necessarily always lose weight on them um because you know maybe it because it can be quite hard to keep the grass low enough or um there are some who might just stand at a hay feeder for example and not actually move around more so just as with any setup anything you're doing with your horse is really important to constantly manage their weight and monitor their weight um and, and check how things are going so that you can adjust if necessary um, and also in terms of health, um, obviously, as with any horse that's on a low grass diet, um, you should always have a good, uh, good quality balancer with um, to give them some good, good quality protein and so on. Um, so especially if your grass has little, sorry, if your track has little grass um, and you're feeding soaked hay, that's really important. Most commonly, people were using tracks for laminitis, followed by arthritis and equine metabolic syndrome. And 62% of people said that their horse's weight decreased on a track. So um, it was uh, overall owners said it was the most successful for losing for horses to lose weight. But um, as I said, that will vary completely depending on the individual horses and the setup of the track. The main concerns and limitations of the track were firstly the workload. So um, unfortunately, all that space with horses kind of in together means a lot of poo picking. And if, you know, I mentioned that the track did like two or two miles. I mean, imagine dragging your wheelbarrow around two miles uh, of track every day is poo pick, not much fun. So um, that needs some careful thinking about, um, you know, whether you get a, a quad or, or, or what, or how you're going to do that. Um, the nutrition, as I just mentioned, needs some careful thoughts. If horses are being heavily restricted in their intake, um, need to carefully monitor their vitamins, minerals and protein. Um, they need to be in control of the land. It can be quite frustrating for people if they're at you know, a livery and, and can't put um, this sort of thing up. And then uh, also individuality. This goes for all of our um, all of the different uh options we're looking at today but maybe particularly for tracks so um as i said some horses struggle with the concept of needing to go around to get to a resource so it may not suit all of them um and certainly that's what our behaviorists felt um some horses as i said simply wait at the hay feeder so that needs some careful thought as well depending on how um how bright your horse is and whether they're like oh hang on a second i can just do this it's much easier um and also herd dynamics so if you and i totally recommend doing this because it's a real education for all of us, but if you um, follow some of the track livery Facebook pages and uh, when they introduce a new horse, they are so, so careful with very slow introductions. First of all, swapping droppings, uh, gradually letting the horses get to know each other. Um, and that's some, I mean, that's what we should all be doing. But they are um, exemplary in their introduction of new horses. Uh, and I, I think part of the reason is that because the horses are in a closer confine, it's, it's even more important that they get on um, more quickly. So lots to learn there. Um, it can be expensive. Obviously, buying an electric fence to put in your initial track isn't expensive, but it will not be long. Let me tell you before you're like, oh, I would really like a sand pit and I would really like this. And I'd love some pea gravel and so on and so on. So slippery slope, as with everything with horses, eh? Um, and lastly, uh, the environment and soil management. Now, in contrast to the system we're looking at next, um, so unfortunately with tracks, what we're encouraging is for the grass to be kept you know, really short and for the footfall to be uh, constant on those certain areas. Um, and that is actually really encouraging soil degradation. Um, and that's actually pretty bad for the environment and for the land. However, um, you are, it's sort of, trying to weigh it up because the center area has a lot less footfall than it would even if it was kind of traditional paddocks so it's a bit like the outside land is being sacrificed for the inside land but um depending on how you feel about that um that is a kind of a, a point of contention 
So that leads on nicely to talking about the next system, which is entirely opposite, um, called Equicentral. And this is an idea pioneered by Jane and Stuart Myers, um, who have some really awesome resources, um, which I totally recommend, even if you're not interested in Equicentral, in terms of learning about pasture health um, and soil health and how you can bring those ideas into your horse care, whatever system you're using. So um, Equicentral, this idea really comes from um, modern farming methods, which are which are geared towards thinking, starting with soil health in order to get healthy plants and therefore healthy livestock from the plants. So um, the Equicentral system aims to use those sorts of approaches to manage our horses and also to mimic um, the kind of more natural herd behaviours of having periods of time grazing, followed by periods of time just chilling out. So traditionally, an equicentral looks a bit like this on the right, oh, sorry, on the diagram here, where you have the kind of orangey bit is like an open yard. So sometimes that's like a stable yard with all the stables open, or it could be um, an arena, or it could be just an area like, I don't know, your car park <laughs> or whatever. So an area with no grass, um, which has a shelter, and that's where you put all of your resources. Uh, so water, soaked hay, enrichment, um, and so on and so on. So that's where the horses hang out and that's called the loafing area. And then leading off from that, you have um, a range of different paddocks, probably more than we have here. So there's, uh, there's four in this diagram, but you'd probably have more than that. Um, and they are used in a very light rotation. Now, most horse people say they rotate their paddocks, but the equicentral is based on the idea that you, um, we really want horses to be eating the longer stalky grass, which is much higher in fibre, and that we really want to be encouraging maximum plant biodiversity. So we don't just stick them out on some rye grass pasture and put them on each each field for a season. Instead, what we do is really encourage our grasses to be so we would, you know, you probably um, reseed, encourage uh, lots of different grasses, um, you know, bits of, you know, clover, all sorts of, um, uh, you know, hedgerows and so forth. So there's lots of, um, you've got lots of biodiversity going on there and your horses might go on it only for maybe a couple of hours each day for a week before they move on to the next paddock so it stays really lightly used before you rotate and then if you imagine using each one for like a week then as you come around then you'll be like six weeks later you'll maybe come back to the first one for example obviously according to the number of horses you have um, and so forth so basically on that system the horses um the yard is always open so the horses will go out for a little while and graze and then when they want to they choose to come back and uh hang out in the yard and rest um as natural herds do and uh, and they'll chill out they'll have the water and so on and because all the resources are on the yard they have to come back when they want to drink so that's encouraging their movement to, to kind of go up and down so most commonly Equicentral, um, again, we had around three to five horses on around two to three acres of land. So um, the land use, a bit like tracks, is um, it's pretty economical because the main footfall is kept in that yard area, which is surfaced. So we're not kind of ruining the land like we um, would do if, you know, on normal setup, you had three to five horses on two to three acres. It was even more important with Equicentral that people were in control of their own land. And in terms of what people liked about Equicentral, um, primarily people liked talking about, like working out that they were looking after the land and the environment and that that helped them to look after their horses. So if you're interested in learning about conservation and the environment and soil health, as we should all be, um, then it is really uh, interesting. And there is a lot to learn from the resources um, that those guys have developed, even if you're not planning on using the system. Um, of course, again, it means that the horses live in a herd, but there is flexibility. So some people were saying, for example, if the horses were becoming overweight, they could keep the overweight horses in the yard area, while the less overweight ones could go and hang out um, down in the grass um, and so forth. So there was a lot of flexibility with that. And also um, there's a lack of mud because um, if you think about looking after soil um, and the more we kind of learn about soil, actually mud is basically symptomatic of us using our land badly um, and of soil degradation. So we never ever really should be seeing mud because it means that we're not um, we're not protecting our soil well enough by, uh, you know, gr uh, our, um, grass cover and so forth. So um, th this system, basically, you avoid mud because you want to look after the soil. But obviously that is really lovely <laughs> for people and for horses as well, because who likes mud that much? 
So again, primarily the system was used for laminitis, followed by arthritis and equine metabolic syndrome, with the same premise that it encourages movements um, and grazing on a low calorie forage. Um, so as I said, this is different. So tracks were grazing on like hardly any grass and soaked hay. These guys are grazing on soaked hay while they're in the yard and then fibrous stalky grass while they're out in the field. Now, fewer horses uh, lost weight on the system and reportedly, so most commonly people said that their horses maintained their current weight. Um, and um, I think that's quite interesting in terms of if we think about allowing them to graze on this type of grass. So. Um, this is this is a picture from um, equiculture. Um, so of the you know exactly you know you can see how many different types of grasses there are there and the length the horses are on. So um, ideally, horses therefore would learn that you know their lifestyle is chilled. You know they're always going to have access to this. It's totally fine. They don't need to go out and bend. Um, and reportedly, um, that works really well for some. However, obviously, we do have to be super careful. And if you've got a horse that's currently got EMS or is at laminitis risk or whatever, then it would be something that you'd have to introduce incredibly carefully um, and also look at other factors that might be stressing your horse out. So because, you know, they're only going to learn to not binge eat if they're not stressed in other ways. So um, need some careful consideration. Again, you also need to be in control of the land. And also, um, if you think about setting up that yard environment, I mean, you may already have a yard that kind of leads to different fields, in which case, great. But if not, the, the cost of setting up an area with hardcore um, and a shelter um, can be prohibitive for some. So um, thirdly, rewilding. So um, this is a, a, a kind of diff complete different philosophy again, but uh, a bit more like this is like aquaculture, but to the extreme. Um, so the rewilding philosophy is basically that our land it is a bit it's really interesting if you get learning about it basically our land um, even if you think about land that we traditionally think is of like wild as like moorlands and so on then actually um, it's heavily managed and we're, we're constantly kind of adjusting things trying to encourage some species to flourish you know managing the plants and so forth but actually that's kind of unnecessary because the whole point of wildlife is that ecosystems work in such an integral way and, and if we focus on one then obviously we're disrupting all the others but if you allow nature to flourish then the whole ecosystem will rebuild itself so rewilding is basically uh, focused on this idea that actually we can kind of allow the land to take over and the wildlife to take back over. So full rewilding systems basically will take a massive area of land and um, and uh, put back as much um, kind of goodness into the soil as possible and then see what happens. <laughs> so um, the best example, obviously, that's a really simplistic way of putting it, but the best example um, is the NEP estate, K-N-E-P-P, -P, uh, down in Sussex. Um, and you can read about it in a book called Wilding by Isabella Tree. That's Wilding by Isabella Tree. Really, really interesting. Um, and they talk about taking a farm from, you know, a totally traditional arable and uh, cattle farm uh, which has been farmed for generations and generations and continually kind of losing money and the frustration of that um, and um, and then try and then turning it back into a totally wild ecosystem and, and watching what happens with nature and the plants um, and wildlife that come back to it and as part of that it's obviously natural in the UK to have whale ponies um, to help with the kind of conservation of grazing and so on. Um, so yeah, it's so interesting to learn about and totally I think it's important for us as horse owners, even if you're not going to do this, and obviously it's you know quite unique, um, that we kind of we learn about how those ecosystems work and where our horses can fit in. So we did have some owners who were doing this um, in their lands, but importantly, we also had um, quite a few owners who were doing what we call partial rewilding. So although they didn't have enough space to do like a full salon system like at NEP where they have like you know, I don't know, 100, a couple of hundred acres or whatever. Um, people were, would do it like rewilding areas of their land or, and the horses would graze it very lightly, like maybe, you know, a couple of days every month or whatever. Um, or uh, people were doing like, you know, half of their land would be completely rewilded like all summer and they would just use it in winter, for example. Um, people who did rewilding often used co-grazers such as pigs and cows who would help to kind of plough up that land, their droppings would help fertilise it um, and so forth. And um, the idea is that all the, um, all the, the creatures there kind of work together um, to, you know, form part of that uh, unique ecosystem, um, which I 
definitely can't do justice to within five minutes. Um, but yeah, so basically, so we had, as I said, a bit of a differentiation between people who were doing like a full rewilding where you'd have probably over 20 acres and then people who had less acre, acreage but um, were dedicating some of it to a rewilding system. Um, so I think the numbers there are a little misleading. Um, but with this, people generally had to be in control of their own land, although we did have people who rented and had to rewild, which was interesting. Um, with this system, people reported that their horses lost weight in winter but gained it in summer, um, which is unsurprising because this is kind of the most natural lifestyle we could have for our horses. Um, and, um, you know, that's what would naturally happen in the wild and, in fact, what we should all be aiming for. See the ribs in spring. Um, so, yeah, so horses would lose weight over winter. And um, people found it helpful, again, primarily laminitis, arthritis, and guess what, equine metabolic syndrome. So again, this is a bit more like the uh, equicentral system where the horses are grazing on um, unimproved grasses, natural, um, uh, you know, old grasses, like old pastures and so on, um, rather than rye, you know, or rye cattle grasses that are traditionally on, on many yards, um, which is potentially why it might be more helpful for uh, laminitis and equine metabolic syndrome than you would expect. Um, but also people found it useful for managing behaviour and stress because obviously this is like the most natural horse lives you can get. So finally, woodland and moorland. Um, these basically, as they say on the tin, uh, involve turning horses out in areas such as woodland or moorland, uh, which are traditionally kind of not really thought of as like horse spaces. So I don't know about you, but I've been on several yards where there have been some woods which have been uh, fenced off um, and, you know, aren't seen as spaces for the horses to uh, to go in. Uh, but why is that? Because actually woods um, are really nice areas for horses because, um, well, for horses who can't take too much grass because actually there's hardly any grass grows in them anyway, but they're really enriched spaces. There's lots to kind of forage on. And there's lots of scratching bows, shade and so on and so on. And similarly, moorland provides low quality grasses, but the horses have to move, you know, a long way. However, both systems were very prone to mud. So you can imagine in woods where there's not much, you know, grass cover and so on can get muddy very quickly and, and moorlands are often very boggy. So both had to be managed carefully in winter. So um, again, most commonly, um, woodlands had uh, three to five horses on two to three acres, um, which meant it was quite a good use of land again. But uh, often the, both of these systems, the horses had to be completely removed in winter and, and stabled um, partly or, or revert to traditional paddocks because um, because of the issues with mud and so on. Um, and um, again, people were often in control of their own land um, and, you know, often I think landowners aren't so keen on um, <laughs> horses in non-traditional spaces or mud. So that's kind of understandable. Um, moorland, we didn't have too many people using this, so it's not statistically significant or anything. But um, again, people either had small areas of moorland or massive spaces, a bit like the um, a bit like the rewilding. Um, and then the horses would go on it as, as a kind of herd. Um, the woodland system was good for weight loss in particular. 48% uh, of people said that their horses lost weight on woodland, um, which was not the case so much for moorland. Um, on moorland, we had 60% of people said their horses maintained weight, and that was similar a bit to rewilding. So the horses would uh, lose weight in winter and then gain it again in summer, um, as, is, as is kind of more uh, natural, as it were. But again, both of them, laminitis, arthritis, as you can see, is the most common reasons people were using them. Um, and interestingly, people also used uh, woodland for, uh, for breathing issues. So over to you. Um, so I've put what do you think your horse would choose? But I don't mean that in a um, sort of sanctimonious, oh, you should do this way. I mean that in a genuine way, because all horses are individuals um, and they all have different life experiences um, and likes and dislikes and so on. So um, aside from, you know, your personal preferences, what do you feel that your horse as an individual would choose? Um, and then in comparison to that, like, what do you think would work well for you as an owner? Um, and I'm also intrigued to hear whether people think that the things that their horses would like are also the things that are good for their horses' welfare, <laughs> and also whether they're good for the environment, or are those like three different things? Um, so yeah, really keen to hear from you um, and, and for any kind of feedback on all of that. 
So I hope that's been helpful and given you some food for thought. Obviously, that was kind of a really quick whip round and there's like loads of things that um, I haven't had time to kind of focus on and so forth. So please feel free to email me if you have any um, thoughts or queries or concerns or whatever. Um, I'm also on Twitter. You are most welcome to drop me a message. I'm always keen to chat to people. Um, so, yeah, and um, yeah, I'll look forward to hearing from you and the questions. Thank you very much. Tamsin, thank you so much. That was brilliant. Um, you gave us so much information. I think your Wi-Fi connection struggled a bit a few times. Oh, sorry. It, 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 no, don't, God, don't worry. It's just technology. But I, I think hopefully everyone got, because your slides were so good in, in supporting what you were saying. So ap apologies for that sound connection a few times. Sorry, but no, no, no. So, but for the Q&A, we should be fine because we're not relying on, on the presentation. So apologies for that. But Tamsin, brilliant. Um, uh, you know, covered as ever so much ground um, mm -hmm. and lots of questions coming in already um, it, it, please do when you're looking at the questions uh, upvote the ones that you see there um, or, or place in your own questions if you'd like in the Q&A on Zoom or um, on the comments function on Facebook because we're keeping an eye on that as well I should have said earlier uh, that our next webinar in a fortnight's time is on tacking up being in pain or being a pain or in pain and that's on April the 14th with Sue Dyson that many of you will know and our own Adam Cummins and we'll place a link to that in the chat function shortly. Now before I introduce Sue we've got another poll question which obviously means I have to um, do something always a danger. There we go there's our second part what is your attitude to your alternative grade systems that Tamsin has just um, described um, and we've got various options here again no right or wrong answers but to say I can't use one of these systems I plan to I'd love to but I can't I'm not interested in one of these systems or I don't have a horse so whilst you're um, taking part in that poll I'm just going to introduce you very uh, quickly to uh, Sue, who um, knows one or thing, two things about World Horse Welfare, considering she's been with us since 1997, and she's been a uh, farm manager um, at, at our Norfolk Centre, I think, and since 2008, but I might be wrong on that. I can't, um, what, what, 2000 and when, Sue? Seven. Seven. Um, so uh, so she, she knows one or two things, but you would have thought, in all the time that Sue's been with World Horse Welfare and the fact that she has grown, she's an extremely accomplished um, carriage driver. She's driven and she's been on a back step. If you've ever been on a back step of a, a, a carriage driver going full pelt, you know, you've got to be a bit of a nutter to do that. But yeah, she's happy to do anything with a horse on the ground, long reining in a carriage, but she's not so happy to ride a horse and will only ride a very safe cob. How you quite work those two out, I have no idea, but luckily we have many other wonderful riders at Hall Farm, so it's not a problem for a charity. But um, you'll know that Sue's made great tracks in, in life when she, we, we do get her onto a horse and maybe even get her around a cross-country course. How about that, Sue? There we go. There, there, there's a New Year's resolution for you, whatever that may be. Anyway, before handing the floor over to you, Sue, um, um, Basil, let's have a quick look at the answers to the uh, poll question. Uh, look, that is really good. So we obviously pre previously had a third who were using... Um, I think mainly the, uh, the, the track systems, but look at that, nearly half, getting on for half, 44% plan to use one of these systems in the future. And, and of course, yeah, a fifth of you saying you'd like to, but you, you, you can't. So a really good spread there. So thank you for engaging in that. Um, and Sue, uh, without further ado, I'm going to stop screen sharing and it's over to you. Lovely. Thank you, Rowley. I'll just see if I can share my screen there we go okay so I've got quite a hard act to follow there Tamsin so thank you for that but you've you've given me a whole list of things to think about and I'll definitely be approaching Rowley with uh, additional budget requirements to put some of these new systems in place at Hall Farm over the upcoming months um, so I'm sure it won't be a surprise to anyone to learn that managing the grazing here at Hall Farm is by far one of our biggest challenges we have an average stocking level of 110 horses and ponies at any one time, from Shetlands to Shires and pretty much everything in between. 
But not only do we have a vast number of horses at Hall Farm, our stocking level is continually evolving. So we're continually having new horses coming into the farm and we're continually rehoming horses through our rehoming scheme. So that can prove quite difficult to manage the horses in an effective way. We have a long list of considerations for our horses. So we need to think about where the horses have come from. As most of you will be aware, you know, we're bringing in horses from a variety of different welfare situations. Some have been living out 24 seven, whereas others have been shut away in dark confined areas for months, if not years. So we have to consider how we integrate them back into any sort of grazing system very carefully. Now, with all those complex issues to deal with, it can be quite time consuming. But like most people, we have to go through a, a, a very sort of basic list of what to consider before we decide to turn our horses out. Um, so what do we need to think about? Um, well, we need to think about um, what type of horse we've got in front of us, what breed, what size, what age. Do we have a more thoroughbred type who we know can normally um, and endure a lot more grass without gaining um, excess weight? Or is it a native type of horse that just looking at the grass tends to pop pile the pounds on? So we need to look at what type of horse we've got. We need to make sure that we um, assess the horse's current weight. So is it underweight, overweight, or is it a really good weight at the moment? And the only way to do this effectively is to get hands on. You can't stand back and look at your horse and try and come up with, a, with an average score of what your horse's weight is. You need to physically get hands on, feel for any fat deposits over that horse. It's the only way to have a really honest appraisal of your horse that's standing in front of you. You also need to consider whether your horse has got any pre-existing health conditions. So does it suffer with EMS? Has it got cushions? Does it have any breathing problems? Does it suffer with sweet itch? Has it had laminitis in the past? These are all factors that will start to make you think about what type of grazing system might be suitable for that individual horse. Once you've assessed your horse, you can start to think about the actual grazing itself. So how much grass have you got? What type of grass have you got? Um, what, what different varieties of grasses have you got in your paddocks? And what type of soil are you on? So here at Hall Farm, we're on very sandy soil. So it makes grazing our paddocks quite difficult. We can't allow our paddocks to be grazed down too short because there's always that heightened risk of our horses ingesting too much sand and ending up with sand colic. When you're looking at your grass and when you're looking at the facilities that you have, start to think about how can I adapt those facilities if I need to? Can I restrict the amount of grass my horse is on or can I change my horse's routine? And one thing to consider when you're thinking about the routine for your horse is it needs to, it needs to obviously um, suit your horse, but it also needs to suit you. What it needs to fit in around your work life, it needs to fit in around your lifestyle in general. So it needs to be a routine that both you and the horse can adapt to and maintain. You need to think about whether you want your horse to live out 24 seven or whether you just want it to be turned out for part of the day or part of the night. So what do we think about here at Hall Farm? So with 110 horses roughly to deal with, we prefer wherever possible to turn them out in small groups or small herds. We're very careful about making sure that those groups and herds are as compatible as possible. Now, the majority of horses that come into Hall Farm are native types. So as we've already mentioned, you know, they're prone to gaining weight just by purely looking at the grass, let alone grazing it. So we have to be very careful about managing our horses weight here at Hall Farm. And although we are quite successful with the majority of the horses being able to live out 24 seven, there are those odd ones that we really struggle to manage their weight. We struggle to get the weight off them. And even when we have dieted them down to an appropriate weight, we struggle to maintain it. So with those horses that tend to be the overweight ones, the ones that are harder to lose the weight, we choose to turn them out overnight. So overnight, you've got a lot less sugars in the grass, therefore a lot less calories. 
So that way we can limit how much the horse is eating in a period of time. Now we're very lucky at Hall Farm because we've got these large bark paddocks that you'll see in the photographs here. So they're all, so although it might seem a little bit strange bringing your horse in through, in through the day to so-called lie in bed all day, if you can create a, um, a hard standing area or a bark standing area like we've got here, it can make all the difference. So our horses that come in through the day are popped into one of the bark paddocks. We'll normally have two or three horses in each paddock. And then we'll encourage them to continue to move around throughout the day by putting their soaked hay in small hold hay nets around the perimeter of the fence. And then depending on the, on the sort of the herd dynamics of the two or three horses, you'll tend to get a more dominant horse that will tend to push the other horses off the hay net and continually want to go around each of the hay nets one at a time. So that tends to encourage a little bit of movement around, around the bark paddock, which helps. Now we've already mentioned that we're on sandy soil, hill, sandy soil here. So we're limited with how um, short we can allow our paddocks to graze. But we do need to be able to limit the volume of grass that the horse is consuming in, in a set period of time. So we've divided a lot of our larger fields up into a lot, a lot of more smaller paddocks now. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to limit the amount of grass that the horse has access to over a set period of time. We can avoid grazing the paddock too short but we can also rotate the paddocks regularly to make sure that we're managing how much grass the horse is getting and that it's the right length of grass to keep the horse fit and healthy. Now we've already mentioned predominantly the horses we have come into Hall Farm are native types, but we are fortunate enough to also have some thoroughbreds and thoroughbred types. So one system that we found is really useful here, certainly in our larger fields, is to use our thoroughbred types to graze the fields down before we put the native types onto them. Again, this just allows us to control the actual volume, the quantity of grass that's going to be available to the native horses when we put them on the field. And we've found this works really, really effectively at Hall Farm. Now we have introduced a track system at Hall Farm. Um, we've taken over one of our largest fields. Um, do apologize for the quality of the photographs. It's not ever so clear in the photographs, but basically the track system um, goes around the perimeter of this field. And if I just go to the next slide, you can just see the field is also divided with strips across the, fr the, the from the front of the field to the back of the field. It's also divided in strips. And we can use our gates to section off any of those strips as we choose to. So the horses will start off by having the full perimeter of the field only. And then we can start to open up a strip at a time just to allow them that little bit of additional controlled grazing as and when they need it. Now we're able to open up the strips at either end. So the horses are never quite sure which end we're going to open up. We've got the shelters in each corner of the field to provide shelter from all of the elements. And we've got water tanks situated around the field, but we will only allow one of the water tanks to be accessible at any one time. And it will always be the water tank that's the furthest point away from the main grazing area. Now we've found this works particularly well for our mares at Hall Farm. So our geldings, despite their age, tend to be a lot more active and a lot more playful in the field. But over the years, we've observed that our mares are by far a lot lazier than our geldings. Even our young fillies tend to be very, very lazy in the field. So our track system at the moment is predominantly used for our mares, whereas our geldings are much better at controlling their weight because they're just that much more active in the field on a daily basis. Uh, this year we're quite excited because we're also going to be introducing a, a, a track system around the perimeter of quite a few of our fields. So you can see this is an overhead shot of the track surrounding some of our paddocks. If I just go to the next slide, you can see some of the sort of close up of the tracks themselves. So this, we're really excited about this because it's going to actually make better use of the tracks that surround all of our paddocks at Hall Farm. 
the horses will have much, much more room to roam around and um, interact and behave much more naturally like they would in the wild. They're going to be able to forage along the tracks and along the hedgerows. And we're really hoping that it's going to actually increase that level of exercise um, sort of tenfold. So we're really excited to be putting that in later on this year. So as you can see, we've got fairly straightforward systems here at Hall Farm, just because we're managing such a, a high number of horses at any one time. Um, but we still think your grazing systems can be effective. You just need to be very honest about assessing your horse before deciding how to graze your horse and where to graze your horse. Continually monitor your horse in the field to see how active it is and see what its eating habits are. Is it the type of horse that moves around a lot when it's grazing or does it just stay in one place and graze? Monitor your horse's weight on a, on a regular basis by getting hands on and fat scoring. And if you do see any changes in your horse's weight, however subtle, make sure you act straight away. Don't wait. Make a change straight away, be that either restricting how much grass your horse is on or starting to bring it in for through a period of the day or to start to increase its exercise to counteract that those calories that it's ingesting. If you've got your, your facilities and you're able to adapt your facilities, then try to. And our sort of take home message here would be just the smallest of change that you can make to your horse will make a huge difference to its overall health and well-being. Thank you very much. Sue, thank you. That is great. Well, so listen, it's eight o'clock. We've got uh, we've got plenty of questions to get through, so we will kick on with them straight away. Um, uh, let's go back to the topic. Remember, if you've got the, if you've seen the questions on Zoom, please do upvote them, and, and they'll come to the top of the list much easier. Um, terms in kicking off, Annalise and Jane have both asked about asked about herbs. So Annalise has said, um, "I'm really <laughs> interested to know how you get horses to allow them to eat it, but not eat it all." Um, and, um, and 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 I can't remember the other ones disappeared. But you know, what what advice around <laughs> herbs? We've... Yeah, uh, such a good question. So I think that would depend on what herbs you've got. Um, so I did see the question, the second was about what types of herbs as well, and that they sort of link together. So I'm just going to, I, I found a list of the types of herbs just in the break. Um, so um, so people are using basically anything, and I guess that's one of the interesting things is finding out what your particular horse likes. But uh, so for example, comfrey, licorice, dandelion, chamomile, goldenrods, echinacea, red clover, parsley, mint, marshmallow, fennel, fenugreek, and the list goes on, and nettle things like that so um you know some of those are really common things that you'll have around anyway and you probably have all of us have nettles in our field right but and if you cut them down your horses often quite like them once they're dried so um yeah it could be a problem if you had something super tasty it could be a problem that the horses would obviously blitz it um so people do various things ranging from maybe having a herb garden that can be shut off or having several herb gardens that can be like rotated um some people will grow them in tires and then have uh almost like I guess like chicken wire over the top so once the herbs grow above the chicken wire the horses can reach it but once it you know the plant gets enough time to sort of relax and settle if you so I mean and regrow um in between so um yeah but but thing you know a lot of those are things that are growing in your field anyway it's just encouraging them like like for example thistles you know the horses like them when they get to a certain stage and that's fantastic so yeah I think it's really about finding out what they like um ideally not things they're going to binge on and then working from there but yeah <laughs> yeah Absolutely. Brilliant. Um, Sue, for herb wise and in terms of how we manage that at Hall Farm? Yeah, we, we don't really have an awful lot of herbs. Um, unfortunately, we are quite sort of one dimensional, one dimensional in terms of what our paddocks have. So that is something that, you know, again, I would, I would quite like to look into um, for the future. Brilliant. Um, Jill's asked about what was the list of herbs you read out there, Tamsin, but what we can do is, well, if you just go to the recording, you'll be able to, 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 to get back to it there. Um, Faye um, has asked around, when starting a track totally from scratch in an ungrazed field, what would you say the most important thing to do to start with would be, Tamsin? Um, yeah, that's a nice question. Um, I would say, personally, and I'm interested to hear Sue's 
feedback on this as well but uh, I would say look at the condition of your horse now and be honest about how much grass it can have and what you need to do with the weight so it as often people the reason they want to start a track is because of weight which is why I'm saying that so if your horse is overweight then usually and you've got a grassy field then usually putting a track around the outside is not going to be enough to manage the weight so um probably the first thing I would do is to um maybe start strip grazing where you where you want the track to be so that you can gradually create a track maybe borrow some sheep for it maybe borrow some extra ponies if you can to eat that grass down on the track if you're not worried about weight then the first the best that you can do is put in your electric fence track and, and crack on and then kind of you, you'll work it out from there and work out what works for you what, what works with the land that's there and so on but um yeah I would definitely say if you're worried about weight then uh, either strip grass it which Sue was talking about as well or um yeah sheep borrowing sheep I think is probably the answer for a lot of us <laughs> or goats of course or goats yeah no goats <laughs> <are bad. laughs> they run away <laughs> like to you. Um, uh, Sue there's quite a few questions around um size uh, you know we we all grew up didn't we on a one acre per horse um when we're thinking of the track systems and for whole farm and I'll come to Tamsin in a second on this but what what, what does, does it change in terms of that metric yeah, to, well, for, for us personally, yes, um, there's not there's not a scientific answer there. You know, we very much use um, what what we see and what we observe and that continually continual assessment process. So we've got our track sim system in place. We will look at the horses that we're aiming to put on it. We will determine how many we need to put on it, um, which will come down to the horse's individual weight and how much grass is available. And then we will genuinely monitor those horses very closely over those first two or three weeks that they're on it, um, just to see any subtle changes in their weight going up or going down. But the other thing we'll do, we'll do two more things. We'll also count how many droppings the horses have got, are having in the field. That will give us a rough idea of whether they're getting enough forage, whether they're getting enough fiber. And also we will always look at the grass that's growing outside of the track system. So I think one of the most misleading things is you can look at a track system or any type of grazing and you can think, oh my goodness, my horse is definitely not getting enough grass. You know, poor thing, it's getting absolutely nothing. But if you look just to the left or the right and you actually see the grass that's growing along the, the side of your paddock to the outside the perimeter of the field, you will actually see the true amount of grass that your horse has been eating. It's just eating it far too quickly for you to be able to see it growing up so I think you know I think for me um, managing the number of horses we do here it definitely comes down to that continual observing them in the field and continual fat scoring and assessing them to determine whether they're getting enough grass or too much. Brilliant. Tamsin any further thoughts on, on that acreage question? No, um, I think Sue's answered that. Yeah, exactly what I would say. Really, I, it's, it's such an interesting one because we don't we don't really have research on this yet, which is why we started the report as the kind of first first tiny step towards that. Um, yeah, it does seem like people are successfully keeping more horses on that acreage. Um, it is, but we wouldn't want to encourage people to do that because there could obviously be welfare issues if you end up with too many horses, they're more stressed, they're in a small um, space and so forth. So yeah, I would echo what Sue said that I think that, you know, and for all horse owners, you know, regardless of whether you're using a track or not, that continual monitoring of your your individual horse, your horse's weight and so forth, you know, whatever changes we're making in our horse's lives, as long as we are monitoring our own individual horses uh, in terms of their weight, in terms of their health, in terms of their welfare and well-being and so on, um, then we can't really say better than that. So yeah, I don't think there is a clear answer on the acreage, really. sorry. And actually in terms of, you've, you've talked about, you know, distressed horses, but also stressed grass. Mm. And Christine's asked, what are your thoughts on grazing on stressed grass on a track in regards to the sugar content? Yeah, now that is such an interesting one. Yeah, I saw that question and I thought, oh, uh, so, right, that really depends on your philosophy on and on grass. It's so interesting and it's basically a bit of a minefield. So my brief answer is, having talked to a lot of ecologists, conservationists, vets, nutritionists and so on. So the nutritionist and vet answer is, <clears throat> that if your horse is yes you can have longer grass and it might may have less sugar per gram say but your horse is getting so much more of it because it's eating that long grass that um it's going to get more sugar overall than if it's eating short stressed grass so um if you want your horse to lose weight then giving it long grass is really really not ideal 
Now, the conservationist ecologists would say that there is less, that, that that longer grass is indeed healthier, has less sugar. And um, interestingly, at the Nepa State, which is the main wilding centre that I mentioned, they um, they had issues with laminitis until the grass had been rewilded for several years. And then they've never had issues since, apparently, which I think is really interesting and probably we could do with further study on that. But for most of us who are grazing, you know, probably rye grass, probably not years of, you know, re allowed to mature grasses. If we're worried about weight, then yes, we don't want long, it's really short stressed grass, but at the same time, um, if you want to reduce weight, then you just cannot have that calorie input going in. So it's really difficult, depends on your bit on your philosophy. In an ideal world, I guess we'd have horses with grazing muzzles on long grass, on uh, longer grass, so they can have the longer grass, but not too much of it. Um, but yeah, really difficult. So I would say, if you want to lose weight, then pff, it's not ideal. But the short stress grass is is going to lose the weight, whereas the long grass isn't necessarily. But it's a tricky one. In my field. Sue, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a little bit difficult for us here at Hall Farm, as I said earlier, because we are on the sandy soil. So that's always a consideration. And it's it's really interesting over the last few days, seeing the horses in our fields that are on the shorter grass and they're still having hay put out, but they're choosing not to eat the hay because the grass is obviously tasting sweeter. So that's quite difficult for us to manage because obviously we want to restrict how much grass they're getting, but we don't want them to go down the sand colic. I guess if I could have my absolute ideal and, and Roly was to give me a hundred extra staff, what I would do is I would graze them on the slightly longer grass, but I would be moving them more regularly, sort of every two or three days, I'd be moving them onto the next piece of slightly longer grass. So they're eating it at that optimum length and there you're optimizing the volume of grass so you're getting the best of both worlds but you know realistically you know time constraints don't allow that to happen um so even though we're on sandy soil here we do find that we end up grazing our paddocks down shorter some of the time and we have to top up with soaked hay or dry hay depending on the individual animal but sorry, Sue, so the first part of that answer I didn't hear. So um, just really a bit about the 100 extra staff, that bit is. Um, <laughs> um, question comes in from Jane. Could you please ask about the sand pit, the size, depth, sand type? Um, yeah, we didn't specifically collect data about uh, any of those things, but... Um, the ones I've seen on track, so, uh, well, I, I think they really vary actually. Um, some people use them like almost like a bed. So there's some I can think of where they'll, you know, in the corner of a barn have um, sort of railway sleepers to cut off an area, say 12 by 12, and then fill it with sand and the horses hang out there and lie down there and so on. Um, others will just have an area on their track that's like a, yeah, I guess sort of almost stable size, I guess is what I've regularly seen. Um, I don't know about sand type and I would recommend probably going one of the track Facebook pages and asking um, the people there who do it every day probably be the best thing but yeah so usually it's an area big enough to allow them to roll and lie down and so on brilliant now given the number of questions still to go we're going to have to sort of up the ante now so i'm going to ask them quicker and you're going to answer them quicker <laughs> um, so um sue uh, esther's asked how important is it for the track to be circular compared to having a dead end she's just thinking about the practicality of running electrics um I think the, we try and avoid the corners as much as possible, just again, purely from a safety point of view, you know, you know, with her dynamics, horses can get caught in the corners, etc. So we do have our, we have our, our, our side sort of rounded, so it just encourages them to move around and not get trapped in a corner. Um, but I think, again, that would be down to the, the individual horses, if you've got horses that you think are going to mix well, I don't think it would be a problem. Right. Brilliant. Gabriella's asked, uh, Tamsin, you mentioned NAP, actually, I mean, and she just wanted to, to understand a bit more about rewilding. Do you just leave the land to recover and then it open it all up and let them graze? Or do you reseed like they did at, ne at NEP, sorry, which they obviously did a while ago? Mm -hmm. So just, have we lost Tamsin? She might mm, yeah, ideally you would reseed. and I'd, Yeah, ideally you'd work with like, cons oh, have you? Hello? No, you're back, you're back. Hello? You're back. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah we can Okay, hear. sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, ideally you would reseed, you'd probably work with a conservationist and so on, particularly because a lot of grass is, uh, horse land is very horse sick. So that's why we get so many uh, buttercups and docks and so on. So they would help you to uh, work through that. If you left it for a long time, it would probably sort itself out. But, uh, you know, ideally, if you want to use it, you'd probably work with someone to make it quicker, basically. 
Brilliant. And Harriet, another one for you, Tams. And Harriet, did you have any issues with injuries on moorland and woodland grazing? Um, no, that, people did mention that they were careful about it and they thought that they would have issues, but actually in reality, maybe didn't. Um, we all know what horses are like. If there are things there, then often they, you know, you can have a, the safest paddock in the world and they'll find something to trip over. So I think it's a bit of a, you can't do right for doing wrong sometimes. Um, but yeah, it is something obviously you need to think about depending on your horse, how accident prone they are. If they've got arthritis, for example, you don't want lots of obstacles and so forth. But um, it didn't, people didn't say that they had that issue, no. Brilliant. Um, a question for you, Sue. I love this one from Alexia. How do you stop horses using the track system as a racetrack? <laughs> well, we wouldn't personally. Um, so it, it, we, we're always <clears throat> trying to find ways to encourage our horses to move around more, as I said earlier, especially our mares. So if you've got horses that are quite happy to, to exercise themselves around the paddock, I would say you're a very, very lucky horse owner. <laughs> love it, love it. Um, Says ask um, Tamsin if using a hybrid system, saying tracking the outside and resting the middle of the field, how would you go about including rewilding in the centre fields? Would you would it need to be a separate area completely? Um, I think it depends on your land. If you've just got a field, then yeah, um, uh, ideally it would need to be a different area just because that land will already be set up. So if you want to graze it, it will, you know, you probably won't have enough there for it to rewild. You do need a bit of space. Um, but if you worked with a, for example, a conservationist or someone who knows about ecology, they could probably help you to create areas within it, which could be wilder. So things like creating like areas that are wetter, for example, which might be quite nice for the rest of your land. So sort of encourage the wet to go in one place, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the land you've got and um, what it's been used for before. But I would say, um, yeah, find someone who's interested in ecology to help you if you're interested. Because um, that, just to quickly say as well, people that, you know, this is really great for people who are interested in the environment. So um, if you find someone locally in like your wildlife trust, they'll be like over the moon to hear that you're interested in, you know, working with your land like this. So um, we'd definitely be up for helping you in any way. Brilliant. Um, so you, I, I thought you were going to touch on this earlier, but I, I, you know, horses, you know, doing yoga are, are extremely good at getting underneath a track and grazing what's on the other side of the fence. Uh, but, but someone on Facebook has asked, well, you know, is those unnatural head positions, the downward donkey or whatever it would be, <laughs> can they cause any problems or can they get their head stuck and there's only issues there? Um, well, again, you know, it's, it's um, a bit like a stuck record tonight, but we're very lucky because our electric fencing is connected up to the mains. So when we have our fencing turned on, our horses are very, very respectful of it. Um, I think horses inevitably will always try to go, the, you know, the grass is greener, they'll always try their best to get that little bit of extra grass. Um, I think if you're going to use electric fencing, try and um, use the electric rope rather than the tape, that tends to be a lot less sinister if things do go wrong. Um, but I think, I think what we've learned is if you've set your horses up in a track system where they have got um, adequate grass and they've got adequate um, stimulation from hay piles going out or other things to sort of um, keep them um, entertained and social socialized with each other then we don't tend to have an awful lot of problem with them trying to go under the fencing. Brilliant. Um, question um, here about grass mumps. Any, any, uh, Tams, any, any experience on grass mumps um, in terms of, of alternative grazing systems? Um, do you know if the is, is grass mumps, is that those like horrible tufty things that like where it sort of grows up in a like almost like a ball and you trip over them? Is that is that what grass mumps? Is that what no, the grass mumps I think means. it's an allergic reaction to it with the, the horses get Oh attacked. sorry. Oh, oh sorry. We're in Wales, so we get those horrible things which are like mumps. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Exactly. Yeah, um no, sorry. Um no, we didn't have, uh, I don't think we even had anyone mention that in the um, in the health conditions actually that I can remember. Obviously I probably would have thought of it if not. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess the non-grass track systems or particularly woodland systems would be particularly helpful if your horse is, is very grass sensitive. But no, this, that didn't come up at all. So sorry. Yeah, no, no problems at all. Um, Philip has asked about, I've never heard about the beer bottle rule. Uh, you, you put them in the graze when it's standing up and you take them off when it's lying down. Any, any logic in that, Tamsin? 
Um, yeah, that idea uh, fits with the equicentral principles. Um, so yeah, look at the equiculture site if you're interested in that idea. Um, like I said, that fits absolutely with um, ideas from modern farming um, and evidence-based use of uh, how to encourage the ground, ground to um, be at its optimum health, how to encourage the grass to be at its optimum health, um, absolutely. Um, if you have a fat pony, that may not necessarily work for you, it does seem to work for some people, but it will be very individual. So um, yeah, in an ideal world, great, but um, obviously, you know, apply to your own situation. Brilliant. Um, Sue, Faye's a question, asked a question about the bark paddocks. What foundations did you need to build a bark paddock? Um, so so we, we dug um, the paddock out and then we lined it just with ordinary plant liner. And then we just used a coarse bark to go over the top. Um, and that works really, really well. So it, it's particularly good for our unshod horses or horses that have got foot problems. And as I say, it's an absolutely great management system as well in terms of managing horses' weight. Brilliant. Um, Tamsin, Christine's asked about, uh, she lives in Southern East Scotland. Um, I'd love to introduce hedging mm -hmm. for forage. What is the best quick growing and best eating mm. hedging? Oh, mm. um, not sure. I would ask uh, ask people's experience on some of the trap Facebook pages and so on. Um, I would like to say Hawthorne. Um, yeah, Hawthorne is what springs to mind for me personally, but um, I haven't laid hedges recently, so I haven't looked into it. Sorry. <laughs> no at all. Uh, Sue, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, we're predominantly hazel and Hawthorne oh. at Hall Farm, so and that works really really well and sort of very very um, hardy hedging as well. So hopefully, we'll, it's going to stand up well when we start to to graze around the perimeter of our fields. Brilliant. And then Harriet asks Sue, how, um, in, very interested in splitting land into smaller paddocks. What sort of size and number of horses would you use in general? Oh, it's another going back to that acreage again, you know, again, there, there isn't a, there isn't a set science. Um, so we just divided out one of our huge fields. We divided it into various different size paddocks from half an acre through to an acre, two acres and, and so on. Um, and again, we just very much look at the size of the paddock, look at the horse we want to, to put on it and decide whether that's an appropriate size. And again, you know, it doesn't sound very scientific, does it? But it is about monitoring those horses or monitoring your horses every single day. So going out there, if you've only got one or two horses, counting the number of droppings it's doing, um, looking at the grass on the outside of the paddock and making sure that the, the, the grazing matches the horse's requirements. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Tamsin, someone's asked from Facebook, what's the most popular in the UK between track and equicentral? And I think you said it was by far track. Was that right? Yeah. Um, and then Fiona, yeah. Fiona's asked, when considering track systems and the welfare of the natural horse, is there a conflict between what, what you're denying the horse grazing? Um, is that for me or Sue? Yeah. Or Sorry, Tamsin, yes, yeah, you, yeah, to start. Yeah, sure. Uh, no worries. Yeah, um, yeah. Depending on your horses and how you think about it, yeah, that is definitely one of the concerns that people say. Especially if you've got long grass growing in the centre and your horses are hungry, then um, yeah, absolutely, that could be a concern for them. Um, people tend to feed ad lib soaked hay or ad lib uh, low energy hay, um, low energy hay lids, that kind of thing, um, on their track to kind of mitigate that and also make the track as enriched an environment as possible so that the horses aren't left going, oh, I wish I was on that grass. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And especially if your track was particularly bare or it didn't have too much on it, then that could be a concern. Um, yeah, I totally agree. So, yeah, um, as Sue said, I guess you have to monitor for the individual horse, the individual situation and so on. Brilliant. Sue, a couple of quick ones for you. How many droppings per horse per day shows they're getting enough fibre? Um, sort of, again, down to the individual horse, but roughly eight to 12. So we will turn a horse out onto a paddock, start counting its droppings. And then as we either decrease or increase the grazing, we'll count the droppings to make sure that that, that tallies and it goes up or down accordingly. Brilliant. And for the bark paddocks, obviously you're on sand. If they were on clay, do you think they would need drainage like a manage? I, I have no experience of managing land on clay, having lived in Norfolk all my life and always been on sandy soil, but I would imagine that would possibly be a consideration, yes. Brilliant. Um, thank you. Tamsin, we're, we're almost coming to the end. Faye's asked, if using tyres, would they cause damage to the land and environment as they, as they degrade? And is there anything else to use instead? 
Yeah, interesting. Um, I haven't thought about this one before. I would say, yeah, I guess you don't want them to degrade. You can recycle tires. So probably I would say they're very useful um, in these systems for things like creating um, obstacles, people fill them up, using them for herb gardens and so forth. Yeah, so I guess in an ideal world, you would uh, replace them after a couple of years uh, when they're likely to start degrading because I think rubber lasts quite a long time and then you would recycle them rather than let them degrade on your land. Um, I hadn't actually thought about that before, but very good point. So thank you for raising it. And Tamsin, final question for you. When you say okay. reseed, would you would that actually mean ploughing up and reseeding or just throwing meadow mix regularly on your rye and clover fields? I think it depends what you're starting with and what you want to end with. Um, if you've got a farm that's been, you know, if your land has been really intensively grazed for cattle with like really intensive cattle rye grass, then yeah, you might want to do a proper job, um, especially if you've got horses that are, you know, likely laminitic and so forth. But if you've got, you know, your average field, then you're probably okay with um, putting some more seed on and, and letting it rest and, and giving it some time. Um, yeah, so it really depends on your land. Um, yeah, and I would, yeah, kind of, like I said before, like find, if you can find someone knowledgeable and people are really keen to talk about this more with horse owners than has previously ever been kind of done. So yeah, do try and talk to your um, local wildlife trust or, you know, any local conservation trusts and so on, because they'll be really happy to help advise you with that kind of thing. So. Brilliant. And Sue, final question for you. Are track systems OK for younger horses? Yeah, we've, we've used them for our younger horses. And again, you know, a little bit more effective for our young boys, because again, a bit like the caller said earlier, you know, they tend to run around and play a lot more. So we, they're even more effective. But yes, we've had no problem with our youngsters whatsoever. Brilliant. Well, listen, I'm going to come to Tamsin and Stu in a second and just say what's your final thoughts on this evening's discussion. But thank you so much to everyone for your questions. We, we've got through well over half of them, but I'm really sorry. There are quite a few still left to answer around size. And uh, hopefully we've covered that off in terms of acreage per horse. Um, so, But thanks so much for putting in your questions this evening. It's been brilliant. And, we, and, it's, and it's, we've galloped along. But as ever, I failed to get around the whole course, for which I apologise. <laughs> Um, Sue Tamsin, thank you to you. Um, what are you. We've heard a lot tonight. You've told us a lot tonight. Um, Sue, I'll come to you first. What, what are your final thoughts? What's your take home message? I think my take home message would be definitely to um, assess your horse thoroughly before you make any decisions as to where to turn it out and how to turn it out. Continue to monitor it on a very regular basis. Make changes as soon as you see any subtle changes in your horse. And be aware that even the smallest change that you make, so an adaption to your um, facilities or a change in the routine, can make a huge difference to your horse's health and well-being. Brilliant. Thanks, Sue. And Tamsin? Um, yeah, I would totally echo that on the, you know, monitor, 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 like Sue said, your horse is an individual, so uh, treat your horse as an individual and, and, and keep an eye on it um, uh, as you make any changes. Um, yeah, and I would just, you know, think through, um, listen to what lots of people have done with their horses, but, you know, think about how it will apply to your land, your specific situation, your personal, you know, what you think is important um, and, uh, you know, how much time you've got and so on, and your horse as an individual. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, the really positive thing is that owners are thinking about friends forage and freedom and kind of centering their horse care around that and managing the environment at the same time so yeah really you know positive picture there and you know thank you to everybody who took part brilliant terms and it's what's come through in both of your presentations and discussion is you know as horse owners we, we we are responsible for managing we have a part to play in managing the environment don't we and and it's, and it's really so and as you said several times times and there is lots more help than it was only a few years ago from local yeah. conservation groups and and, and such like uh, so thank you very much for that go on lo lots to think about and uh, so thank you to everyone for joining us tonight as i said earlier our next webinar in a fortnight is on tacking up being a pain or or in pain with with Sue Dyson uh, and Adam Cummins so we uh, please do we put a, 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 a sign up box in in the chat function there so please do sign up for that thank you so much for joining us tonight as I say we've got through a lot a lot of information and especially from the, the different type of herbs that Sue was talking uh, Tamsin was talking about earlier the, the, the webinar will be available um 
to, to watch again from 9.30 this evening. So please, do, UK time that is, so please do um, look back on that on our YouTube channel. Thank you to everyone from around the world, from America, Colorado and Maine. Apparently it's not snowing in Maine at the moment. Arla, Romania, Slovakia, Brazil, Costa Rica, South Africa, uh, soggy Scotland uh, and many other parts of soggy Britain. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Sue and especially to Tamsin, thank you so much. That, that has been brilliant. Um, you've both been so good that you get a reward for coming back to do a future webinar, um, which is maybe not so good, but no, thank you so much. That's been brilliant. Thank you again to everyone. See you in a fortnight. In the meantime, take great care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.